welcome to an episode, well, first in a long time of Solo Beatles podcast. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Hudson Ranny, and I am joined by, once again, Mark Arnold of the Fun Ideas podcast out of on the West Coast. Um, first of all, before we get into our regular topic, we, I do want to mention a couple things. I'm seeing McCartney in a week. <laughs> so very excited about that. And um, rest in peace, Alan White. I did not see that one coming. I mean, he was old, but like, did you see it coming? Um, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with what you're trying to say. He was old. 72 can be considered old, but at the same time, like McCartney's pushing 80 and he's still touring around. So, you know. <laughs> and I was supposed to interview him. I written, wrote to a publicist in like January and they said, check back in July. Well, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to get the silent treatment for that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now, let me ask you this, since we're talking about him. <laughs> okay. Did you think that the Alan White that was this Alan White in, in Yes and played on John Lennon's Instant Karma was the same Alan White that played on Love Me Do? <laughs> no. I used to. I used to. <laughs> you did? I did, but this is a long time ago because you just see the names. I didn't know. I figured, well, you know, he went on to Yes. And then I found out, oh, the other guy in that Alan White has also passed away. I think he passed away in 2015, if I read correctly. Yeah, so anyway, just a weird common name with Beatle connections, which is really weird. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of weird Beatle connections. There's a lot of weird things in Beatle land. <laughs> so I'm on your show. What do you want to talk about? We're talking about tug of war. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> as your background may have suggested <laughs> well you told me in advance that's probably what we're going to talk about so i said oh okay i i don't have the album accessible i still have the same album i bought <clears throat> 40 years ago <laughs> what was uh life like 40 years ago well i will tell you what it's like in connection to this album okay so first i have to talk more death unfortunately uh so of course lennon died in 1980 yeah. um so in 81 both ringo and george put out albums so a new album by mccartney who really hadn't put one out in to be the last album out was mccartney 2 and that was in mid 80 before lennon's passing so everybody was highly anticipating a new paul mccartney album What's he going to do? Is it going to be a Wings album? It's probably not, but what's he going to do? Is it going to be a Lennon tribute or is it going to suck or what's what's he going to do? I mean, really, honestly, that's what they said at the time. As for me, I mean, I was a huge Beatle fan, as you are, you know, and it's like, I don't care what it is, I'm buying it. Uh, the thing I totally remember, and I always have figured out since McCartney kind of does this, uh, but it was the first time I encountered where I really wanted to buy an album and they kept postponing it to like create like a bigger demand for it. And it's like, ah, you know, before, before that, I don't think I really paid attention to release dates. I just kind of like, Oh, it's, Oh, a new album's out. Okay. I'll buy it. You know, and it's like, at this point I was like, I want the new album. I want the new album. <laughs> and um, I have to say this, that the lead off single was and is not my favorite song uh on the album or in mccartney's thing so i was kind of cringing a little bit because if the rest of the album's like ebony and ivory i'm really going to hate this album <laughs> but fortunately it's like i i like ebony and ivory it's just you know i mean it's kind of like three dog nights black and white it's just kind of nursery rhymey and, you know it's almost like mccartney's own or wing's own mary had a little lamb to me but you know hey simplify racist 
you know, race relations or whatever. Fine, okay. But anyway, that being said, when I finally got the album and I plopped down the needle on Tug of War, um, I was just like, just mesmerized and hooked. And I said, ah, he's back. <laughs> now I take it you weren't a fan of McCartney too. Um, I, I liked McCartney too, but it's an odd album, really, yeah. if you think about it. You know, especially when the previous album was Back to the Egg. It was a Wings album, but it was a harder rocking sound. And then this is M- McCartney's attempt to do like, kind of a new wave-ish album even though that term really hadn't been coined yet uh it it was him kind of noodling around and experimenting is really what they kind of treated it as in fact you know they tended to play the live version of coming up with wings more than the studio version on the radio way back when so which studio version is the better version i'm sorry yeah yeah and that's only in the united states in england i think the studio version was the hit you know here they flipped it over but i think it had I mean, I like that live version, but I think it had to do more with radio programmers at the time were ner- were actually nervous to put out a record or play a record that said just Paul McCartney. And I'll give a reason why, <laughs> because uh, after Back to the Egg came out, the next single that came out was uh, Wonderful Christmas Time which was listed as a Paul McCartney single. Now, love it or hate it, doesn't matter. It didn't chart on the regular pop charts. It only charted on the Christmas charts. And so everybody considered it a flop when it came out. So flash forward five, six months, when coming up and McCartney 2 are coming out, it's like, oh my God, he's putting out another thing under his own name. This thing won't sell. You know, That's how fickle the record company, the record media and everything was back then. I mean, nowadays, if McCartney put out anything, well, he's done it. I mean, he puts out things under Fireman. He puts out things under his own name. He puts out things under uh, any number of names. And people put out Egypt Egypt Station and it sold well. I think that says enough. Yeah. So, I mean, but you got to remember, this is only 10 years after the Beatles. So it's like every solo album was expected to go to number one and if they didn't there was something horrifically wrong with that unless you're Ringo Ringo already flopped by this point so uh nobody cared but (laughs) if you're George John or Paul you had to hit number one or there was something wrong with that record and it's like it's insane looking back on it you know but that's basically how they acted yeah so (laughs) yeah (laughs) now I, yeah, I mean, 80 was a rough year. I mean, and if you think about it, I mean, so it wasn't 81 for the United States. I mean, mm-hmm. our, the president was attempted to, to be assassinated. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure that was terrifying to live through. Well, I mean, that whole year, there was assass- there's four major assassinations. Two were deaths, unfortunately. Well, first one was Lenin. And then, uh, I don't know the order. I think Reagan was next. He survived. I think Anwar Sadat was next. He died. And then the Pope, John Paul II, was next. And that was in the course of a year. You know, yeah. you know. of course, now, I guess, I hate to say, 40 years later, we're having school shootings instead of celebrity and well-known people's shootings. But to me, it's like the same thing. It's like, I don't get it. But you know. I mean, especially what just happened in Texas, like, yeah. these yeah. idiots just put their guns away and we can all live peacefully yeah i mean <laughs> I, I i don't get it i mean i don't own a gun i shouldn't say that because somebody will come after me it's like oh he doesn't own a gun i can get him but <laughs> the last thing i would think of to use a gun for if i did own a gun would be to go to, go to a school or something i mean you know to me it's like if i don't like school i'm staying away from it i don't want to pick off kids i want to <laughs> i'll go somewhere else but i, I my oft coded phrase that i say to my wife all the time after something extreme like this happens in the news over and over i said don't these people have anything better to do you know i don't get it but anyway it's going to be on my tombstone didn't he have anything better to do <laughs> anyway he had to die 
enough enough about death let's move on to life okay yeah. <laughs> now whoops the solo albums that came out um the year before i'm guessing not a big fan of them what the ones in 81 or 80 yeah, which 80. um okay so let me reference my handy dandy beatles on record book which came out in 1982 because my memory doesn't remember which came first? I think George's album came out first, but it I did. Couldn't. Okay. But I remember there was a delay on that one too. And it was because Warner Brothers shockingly didn't like the original album, which I actually do like the original album. Um, so it's kind of weird, but I didn't hear the original album for years. I got a boot like many years later. And I said, I don't know what's wrong with Warner Brothers. I don't know what they were thinking because I mean, this George album is pretty good. And so we're talking about somewhere in England. In fact, I, since I'm looking it up here, um, this page in this book, oops, I can hold it at an angle that doesn't, uh, this is not going to work. Not a, there we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, you can't see it there. Oh, well. Anyway, <laughs> I will describe it. <laughs> I could take the background off too. Um, yeah, the original version showed a uh, Georgian profile over a map of England, which is ironically now on the CD, but that was the original cover it was supposed to be, which in a certain respect, I actually thought that was a better cover too. I agree. And uh, then they put, you know, a picture of George standing behind, uh, standing in front of a, a painting, it looks like a sidewalk. And I always got the impression, what, he's given up and he's just going to lay in the street and let somebody run over him. <laughs> you know, and I don't know if that was his intention, but that's kind of like what I got out of the album. And it's like, OK, now, is that a good album? Um, yes, it's a very good album. Um, in fact, I think, again, the weakest track is the one that was the single, which was all those years ago. Um, it was I like it. I like it. It's not you know, what. Go ahead. It was a bad tribute to Lennon. Yeah. Well, it wasn't even meant to be one. That's the, that's the weird yeah. part about it. It's you like, know? oh, your bandmate of 10 years died. Oh, let's, yeah. you know, take a messy old Ringo track and jazz it up. <laughs> messy. I like that description. <laughs> and then the sad part, and this, this started a trend with virtually every Harrison album. First single did decently or really well. And then the second single, nothing. You know, it's like Teardrops is a decent song. I like it, but it never got any airplay. Uh, nobody has heard of it. It took me forever to find the vinyl single in the store because I used to scour the bins. And if it didn't chart, it was really hard to find a record. Uh, but I did find one way back when. So, <laughs> As Ringo would say, it was too good to be my record. <laughs> now, um, but I had enjoyed uh, the George Harrison album, which was the first album I bought new when I became a fan. Uh, and I think George Harrison and Somewhere in England, very similar, good, solid albums, you know. And I will say that the new tracks, barring all those years ago that he added, are good too. So, I mean, it would be nice if Donnie Harrison, if you're listening, to put out the complete somewhere in england put all the original tracks and all the the revised ones on one like big 16 or 18 track package i don't remember i don't remember how many tracks there are something like that yeah yeah and maybe a few outtakes and stuff uh you know make a nice deluxe package because that's also 40 years old uh, uh anyway <laughs> <laughs> who'd have thought but they'll make I don't a know. giant doing, they'll make a giant teardrop and uh... a giant teardrop yes See, <laughs> I mean, you can only reissue All Things Must Pass so many times. It's like you got to focus on some of the other George's other albums. We'll have a teardrop from uh, Danny and Olivia to keep in the package. Yeah. <laughs> from when now, on, on Tug of War, have you heard anything? Is there going to be some deluxo thing? Or... Well, there's already been one. Yeah, there has been one. But I mean, another one, you know, or is that it? Like, well, Wildlife, they did one and then they kind of redid a little thing for it but that's because... for 50th anniversaries so. yeah okay so we have to wait 10 years okay okay <laughs> so we should be getting one for red rose at the end of the year all right okay. okay 
So, because it's kind of odd the way they reissue these McCartney things. You know, it's just like, oh, we haven't done one in a while. Here, let's put these two albums out now. <laughs> That's kind of... <laughs> it has to be egg. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I still think on the... the it's going to probably be London Town and Egg together, but uh, I still think it's the Rockestra thing that's holding everything up on that. But anyway, yeah, because you have to pay everyone. Or Paul's darn, laziness. Darn it, darn it! You have to pay these people. What a what a thought. Or you could just wipe Pete Townsend off there. There, that that, that solves that. Anyway, <laughs> all the other rockers are dead. Anyway, oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway. <Fair enough. laughs> um. Okay. Uh. Then Ringo's album came out, and I was actually really anticipating that because he had gotten you know at the time you gotta remember i i this is in real time so at the time i thought john was going to be on it even if he had passed and george and ringo were going to be on it and i thought oh this will be a nice final Beatles salute well in the long run none of the Lennon songs got recorded because i know now why uh but also ringo didn't choose to record them which i respect that but at the same time I almost would have done it as a tribute is to record the songs that Lennon, because they, they existed, you know, it's like life, yeah. life begins at 40 and he, you know, he may not have been able to have the technology to do the duets like they did later with like free as a bird. But if he just did his own version of that and nobody told me and stuck them on the album, and it's like, I'm keeping these because this is what we plan to do. And to this day, he's never recorded them. And I thought, well, maybe he can record Life Begins at 80. And he's still, <laughs> you know, and it's like, uh, you know, I know Ringo's sensitive and da, 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 and maybe it would have been in poor taste, but hey, you're trying to sell a record here, dude. And it's like, he, they were offered to him, you know, and it's like, they just hadn't recorded them yet. And You know what Ringo will do? He'll be, he'll do Life Begins at Peace and Love. <laughs> <laughs> and then on one of his more recent albums which i i get ringo records like a fiend nowadays so i don't remember which album is which but the one that he does his version of grow old with me what's with my name Paul. it's on what's my name okay um it's like oh of all the songs of lennon's you choose to do it's that one which wasn't even offered to you and you know you know like i still think ringo would do a killer version of nobody told me because it, it it sounds like a Ringo song, but with Lennon singing. It does, you know. <laughs> you know, nobody told me there'd be peace enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I still want Ringo. Well, if we're talking about Ringo, I still want Ringo to do country songs we know and love. You know, that's uh, country songs I know and love. I still want him to do that album. He still has time. Come on, Ringo, please. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but. The Ringo album for me, Stop and Smell the Roses, is kind of a mixed bag. I mean, the first side is brilliant. And had the second side of the album, had he taken as much care as he did the first side of the album, and what I really mean by that is dumping a couple of the really bad tracks on side two and adding the Lennon tracks, I think it would have been regarded as a much better album and been high, more highly regarded today um than what came out i think it's one of ringo's better albums if i'm being honest yeah well i loved it at the time i will say this because uh, you know i had uh gone through the disasters of ringo the fourth and bad boy and it's like their heads and shoulders above those but then the next one came out which was old wave and that although it's a highly competent album old wave it, it's a little bit it, it, the old wave album actually kind of reminds me of Ringo's current album. So, you know, they're pleasant, but there's nothing terribly remarkable about them. So you know. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I will say Stop and Smell the Roses was a little bit more special. I think it's probably, honestly, one of the last times Ringo put a lot of effort into something. Maybe he did on some of the Mark Hudson ones, but um, no, where that was he all actually... just Mark Hudson doing his old Beatles. Yeah. Light show. But I mean, uh, on Stop and Smell the Roses, Ringo made videos for these things uh, that are actually kind of funny and entertaining. You know, uh, you know, he did The Cooler, which was where some of those videos are for the McCartney songs. And uh, then the Stop and Smell the Roses video itself, where he plays the traffic cop and uh, Rack My Brain is a funny video. And, you know, it's like 
he was having fun and it is so it is a fun album you know there's one Beatles book I forgot the name of it it talks about the worst Beatle albums of all time and uh uh granted it was written about 20 30 years ago but still it 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 uh considers stop and smell the roses Ringo's worst album and they continually continually refer to the album as smell yeah (laughs) and i go it's not that bad dude i mean that first side is great i mean i could list all the songs on the first side but it's like it's just the second side that gets a little weak yeah and i always thought on that album is uh if ringo is trying to be sensitive by not using lennon's songs the, the one song I would have dumped because I, I've never liked it anyway is a song called Dead Giveaways. So yeah, I'm that's like, awful. Yeah, and it's like... Blah, blah, blah. Anyway. <laughs> now, moving on to our topic. Yes. Tug of War. Mm-hmm. Now, you bought this on release day. Yep. Now, looking at the list of people on here. Mm-hmm. Um... I mean, we got Linda and, McCart- Linda and Denny Lane and Eric Stewart doing back- backing vocals. Now, mm-hmm. what in the world happened to Eric Stewart? <laughs> well, I mean... I feel maybe. like he disappeared a couple years ago. Oh, you mean in recent times, or do you mean then? <laughs> in recent times. Oh, okay, I don't know about recent times. I mean, a lot of people were talking about what the hell happened with Eric Stewart then? It's like now he's playing second to second banana to McCartney, and he's and he's failing. You know, it's like <laughs> uh, I mean, people don't like him on this. They don't like him on uh, Pipes of Peace. They don't like him on uh, Broad Street. They don't like him on Press to Play. So you know, I don't mind him. Um, I'm one of the few that actually likes Press to Play uh we'll talk about pipes of peace but i think it's a better album than most people give that one credit for too but i yeah yeah but i'll explain why i'll explain why later so because we're talking about just tug of war the good half of the anyway (laughs) all right go ahead but um like eric stewart like yeah i wrote to the 10 cc publicist Mm -hmm. see about an interview and me not knowing like anything about 10 cc i guess he left the band like 30 years ago <laughs> <laughs> so that was an embarrassing email but um apparently nobody knows the guy was like we have no idea where he is hmm yeah i haven't really kept track of him so maybe he's um one of those uh joe englishes possibly Denny Lane, for all we know. Denny Lane's probably like, he'll be like um, Weekend at Bernie's where they're like walking his body around with stilts. Well, Denny Lane still shows up to Beatles shows and stuff like that. So. Yeah, but he's not allowed to talk to his fans. He's in his cage. <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't know. <laughs> gotta remember all the Beatles shows. Where are you? I forgot. Where do you live? I'm in Vermont. Oh, okay. Yeah, you gotta remember all the Beatles shows tend to be on the east coast the you know maybe pennsylvania gets one uh if the west coast gets one it's 99 out of 100 times in la which is <laughs> not not here you know <laughs> i here mean in that, oregon it, right yeah so i mean it's like if all the conventions were in florida you know for you <laughs> you know it's like you know um so i mean it's a long trek so that's what i'm saying it's like uh the last time they had a beatles convention even remotely close to me uh i didn't go because i was actually somewhere else so it's like you know anyway but yeah it's an east coast thing i don't know why you know i always tell charles rose name people like that can you produce a show on the west coast he goes i don't know what the west coast is like you know and it's like okay fair enough you know so yeah charles and his uh thick uh, boston accent yeah i try to imitate him with a hoarse voice you know (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh charles Go Charles, go Charles. Okay, so He's quite the um, character. <laughs> um, so when this album came out, you know, like I said, uh, it was a sigh of relief. I was kind of disappointed, but I knew McCartney did this. That Rain Clouds was not on the album because that was just the B side. Um, 
And uh, the rarity now, looking back on it, 40 years, is the solo version of Ebony and Ivory, which is only on the 12 inch. Uh, and I don't think they didn't put it on the deluxe edition, did they? Yeah. So I don't that's, think they did. Yeah. So that's still a pretty rare track. You have to get the silly Ebony and Ivory 12 inch. Um, and what else can I say about it? Uh, but, you know, I'll look at the track listing because I, I pretty much have it memorized, but it's easier just to not have to memorize things. <laughs> so Tug of War is a great track. Take It Away is brilliant. Oh. I, was so, I was so glad that that was the second single because McCartney has been notorious before, during, and after this album of putting out a killer first single and then putting out an absolutely sucky track for the second single. Th totally ruining any momentum that the album might have <laughs> you know? but yeah. uh take it away was the right choice um somebody who cares is a, a pleasant song um it, it's i want to say this in a nice way it's it baby paul it's soft it, paul it should have been on pipes and teeth <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you gotta remember both these albums were recorded at the same time. So, I know. Yeah, so that's why, you know, I, I'll reveal it. I always think it should have been a double album. And McCartney's had this problem his entire career. Red Rose Speedway was supposed to be a double album, and then they uh, chopped it down to a single one. Uh, McCartney 2 was supposed to be a double album, they chopped it down to a single one. This was supposed to be a double album. That chopped... I can kind of agree with Red Rose Speedway and McCartney 2 because the full versions of both of those are a little excessive. And especially in the case of uh, Red Rose Speedway, you, know, you get a live track on there, which is kind of random and it kind of goes all over the map and stuff like that. But Tug of War and Pipes of Peace at some point should have been released as a deluxe edition as War and Peace. And it should have been put out as some big definitive statement like, starring paul mccartney with michael jackson with stevie wonder with carl perkins you know and making it a big epic event then a song that's as shitty as tug of peace that's on pipes of peace would make more sense because mccartney likes doing that too where he reprises 1985 where he reprises venus and mars where he reprises uh any number of songs later in the album sergeant pepper you know it's like it's a McCartney trademark, and they uh, didn't allow him to do it. Um, and so, you know, I would have put Rain Clouds on the album. I would have put, uh, what's the other one? I'll Give You a Ring on the album. I would have put uh, Ode to a Koala Bear on the album. And I would have made this big epic disc and say, this is me. I'm back. There's no more wings. I have to show that I can prove myself because there's no more Lennon, unfortunately. And this is my big statement about who I am. And we would revere it as much as everybody reveres All Things Must Pass. But as it is, it's still a good album, but it's just, you know, the good tracks pared down to one disc, which is kind of like what they should have done with All Things Must Pass, in my opinion. But anyway. <laughs> That's another show. That's not my favorite album by George. It never has been. Anyway, but you know that. I've said that up before. <laughs> I know. I just forgot. So, yeah took me by surprise <laughs> <laughs> you know i'd like it more if other george albums were elevated in similar things but it's like to a to a novice beetle fan of george harrison he put out all things must pass and that's it you know he might have done that bangladesh concert and that's it. I mean, George could have died in 1971 for all we care. You know, it's like, you know, it's really sad. You know, it's like, no, he did a lot of good stuff in his <laughs> career, but we're talking about Paul. Anyway, yeah. Workaholic yeah. Paul puts out albums every year. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Or used to. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, Tug of War, I will say that the buildup is very strong. The, mm -hmm. the um, kind of pushing and pulling. And I love the violins at the end. Mm -hmm. um, really powerful. And the horns um, in the whole album, I feel like, are really strong, but especially in this song, it's just like, ba -da -da, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. and like, I've always thought of it as like a song Tug of War being about Lennon and McCartney's friendship, how it was, it's a tug of war 
but if we're trying to outscore each other, it's a tug, and we're trying to win another, it's a tug of war. Mm -hmm. Always thought of it as that. Mm -hmm. I'll agree. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the entire album's considered a tribute album, but uh, certainly you can make, you know, connections to it all because I believe uh, he was already recording the album at the time of Lennon's death. In fact, the day of Lennon's death, that's when they did record Rain Clouds, ironically, you yeah. know, and uh, which I thought that's why I thought it should have been on the album because you know it's like but maybe he just didn't want to be so <laughs> reminded of it almost. down in the mouth on the album i guess you know but it does make you know uh tug of war a very cheery upbeat album considering you know uh and you know again in comparison to pipes of peace it kind of makes that album kind of more of a down <laughs> way you know but anyway um I don't think Tug of War should have been the third single. It's but not a single. It, 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 I really thought the third single should have been Ballroom Dancing because I love that track. And um, even when Broad Street came out and they did a video version of Ballroom Dancing and re-recorded it for unknown reasons, I still thought that should have been a single on there rather than not having a second single at all. But even then, they just did no more lonely nights and then a few months later they changed the b-side and reissued no more lonely nights it's like, yeah yay <laughs> so yeah. uh so i agree with you now what's that you're doing now that that's th a song. This song gets a thumbs down for me well i was gonna say um we skip are, you it. are you a subscriber to beatles fan uh no you don't, not okay yet. you don't but don't but okay. not like half of those guests on this show didn't hear okay. that. Okay. But, um, you can read you can read my copy anyway. <laughs> uh, if you read, I think it's either the current issue or the last issue because they're talking about this very thing. The publisher, um, uh, Mr. King, I forgot his Bill, R. Bill. L. King, R. L. King or something. Anyway, um, he was talking about when he was at a listener party for this very album, and even then. Uh, the song that got the most flack and the most thumbs down was What's That You're Doing? And I didn't have a problem with it, probably because I was also a Stevie Wonder fan. So yeah, yeah. it fits great on a Stevie Wonder album. It probably should have been on uh, Hotter Than July or what's the album that came out after the original Music Aquarium, which is really a greatest hits album with some new tracks on it. And maybe, you know, it wor would work better there you know kind of like girl is mine ended up on thriller rather than on either of these two albums but uh instead they put both stevie wonder tracks on this album which makes it kind of heavy weighted towards stevie wonder but this one sounds like a stevie wonder uh, a song that paul mccartney just kind of did an overdub just like all things must pass you know? i agree <laughs> now saying that i love the track but yeah it should have been on a stevie wonder album and mccartney guesting on it. woman in red soundtrack or something whatever whatever <laughs> stevie wonder was working on at this time they should have thrown what's that you're doing on that album but oh yeah. say la vie. <laughs> now going to probably the tearjerker on the album because mm -hmm. we all know what it's about yeah it's about john yeah. i mean here today mm -hmm. um now, I have to ask you, how do you feel about the Beach Boys here today? <laughs> totally different type of song, but yeah, it's, but it's, it's funny that you say that because when, you know, before I heard this album and I just read the track listing, because a lot of times I get the track listing before I even got the album, I read that there's going to be a song here today. And I said, he's doing a cover of Beach Boys song? Oh, give me <laughs> a break. I didn't know it was a tribute to John. I really didn't. And, uh, you know, of course, today with Facebook and everything, you know, somebody could is here today a cover of the Beach Boys song and two seconds later, somebody will say, no, you idiot. It's a tribute to John. Well, you know, you haven't bought the album yet. But we know. know how much we know Facebook. But I mean, but the way 
things were back then you were kind of on your own i mean it's like most friends i knew they appreciated the beatles but they weren't fans of the solo albums and so if i bought the new mccartney album they'd be like why are you buying that you know <laughs> you know even if it's a brand new album i said i like it but he's so old he's 40 <laughs> it's like yeah so you know i don't know it didn't it didn't strike me as being old or whatever now granted when this album came out how old was i i was um uh 15 years old so oh, wow. yeah i didn't realize you were that young yeah you're my you were my age yeah well we're talking 40 40 years ago i'm 55 now so yeah i was 15 years old when this album came out and i was loving it you know it's like i don't care if this guy's the same age as my dad i mean he's he's a few years younger my dad's actually 84 and mccartney turns 80 in a month uh or less than a month and uh like 20 days yeah but it's scary uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway you know i said hey and my thought was you know as long as you can do it as long as you want to do it what's wrong i even to this day you know i i cheer on ringo and paul's new albums because hey you know as long as you can do it do it you know it's i mean like, I thought McCartney 3 was one of his best albums. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw the Uncut magazine. I don't know if you ever get one. It's a British magazine. But they um, did the 300 best albums in, uh, released in Uncut's lifetime. Now, Uncut tends to not pick the typical top of the charts poppy stuff. You know, they, so it's actually a decent list. The number yeah. one album on the list turned out to be uh, David Bowie's final album uh, that was uh, Black Star. Which um, I, I'm going to be honest, I thought that was one of his best albums personally. Yeah. yeah, so they put that as number one of all time during the lifetime of Uncut. So I was saying, well, I wonder if they put any of McCartney albums because they do give lip service to McCartney. The album, the, the issue talks about McCartney's 80th birthday and it has tributes by Ringo and Brian Wilson, who is also turning 80 and everybody else. And uh, uh, lo and behold, they they did pick uh, McCartney 3 and it's in the top 50. I don't remember what number it ranked at, but I said, wow, you know, because I have friends of mine, I won't name them here, but uh, they're very close to... <laughs> <laughs> they've been on shows with me before but they don't like that album and it's like i'm sure they've been on shows with me too yeah and it's like mccartney three actually is a kick-ass album you know and i always say this it's like if you compare with what frank sinatra was doing at the same age frank sinatra was doing some cheesy duet album where he was just doing his part and then bono would come in and record his part and then so and so would come in and record their part it wasn't even a true duets album and old sinatra was kind of creakily singing his old hits and stuff and there wasn't even a real purpose to doing these albums just no, it, it was just a money grab whereas mccartney three um obviously the situation was mccartney couldn't tour well, what do you do? He could have just sat at home and tended to the gardening or just watched television or <laughs> done what everybody else did during the pandemic. But he his decided... assistant, you know, texted <laughs> his friends for him. Right. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? You'd yeah. probably, I doubt the man even texts himself. I'm sure he has. Well, actually, else to do it he did him. do this during the pandemic, which was hysterically funny, is he figured out the little, uh, things you can put on facetime uh the little faces and and things like that and it's recorded and it's on youtube i think and it's hysterically funny because suddenly he has a pig nose on and you know something he has mouse ears on and just weird stuff and he you know mccartney has the same wit he's always had and you know it's just funny it's like oh paul mccartney got a brand new toy <laughs> you know it's like, you know, essentially what it was but and i'm sure the trolls you know, on the internet were having at it saying oh you know, baby but a lot of people thought it was cute because yeah. you know hey you know it's like but th i i think that's what mccartney was doing and why he could put out a good album because i figured after egypt station this is going to be his last album for a while because he put out a decent album even new was a decent album so new was a great um, album i thought let's let's pause for a bit i'll just tour on these two albums for a few years which is probably what he would have done we wouldn't have gotten a mccartney three or the reimagined one uh and which i think is a good album too in its own right 
and McCartney just would have been touring and touring and touring you know so it was nice for him to have a little bit of a break I mean if you wanted to see him which fortunately now you're getting to but <coughs> I'm sorry you know, you know it's like concerts had to stop for a while but you know I think it was good for him also to kind of rest his voice for a little bit because it was you know, bad <laughs> you know but uh I think the whole thing was the pandemic was very good for Paul McCartney, <laughs> you know, and if you're open to his new music, it's very good to us because we got another brand new album or two, if you consider Imagined as part of that or a double album at the very least, you know, <laughs> so. Um, yeah. Anyway, what was my point of all that? <laughs> Just saying, you know, it's like, I, I'm glad he's still productive it, it, uh, to compare it to tug of war. He, he has that kind of same fire here because it had been um, it had been a while since there's a McCartney album, but it had been two years instead of one year. He was turning them out like once a year. And in a certain respect, I think it was closer to three years because uh, didn't he record most of McCartney too during seven, summer 79? Yeah. So, and he didn't start this album I mean, he started, I guess, late 81, but didn't finish it really properly. Well, late, late 80. The late 80, excuse me. Yeah, that's right. And I even said that he was recording on Lennon's death date. <laughs> anyway, um, but it always suits McCartney every so often to take a little time to stop and smell the roses as it were you know and not churn out too many albums because once he starts churning out too many albums i always think it you know it gets to be diminishing returns which is probably why people like you don't like pipes of peace as much because you know it's like it's the leftovers from this album <laughs> so you know <laughs> yeah but i don't feel that way about um memory almost full and chaos Memory almost full. Uh, I love, that. but chaos. Well, is is that supposed to be a left over leftover album? Memory almost full. I didn't think so, but um, now well, chaos. Even though I don't like it very much, it was a big kick in the pants album because he'd been kind of, you know, doing pedestrian albums at that point too. So it is good for McCartney to get that little kick in the pants to to make him put out good albums unfortunately sometimes then he said it by his own admission on the mccartney interview you know that uh it sometimes is good to have that stress to make better albums but then who wants to be under all that stress right but i think lennon's death unfortunately um helped him make a better album here um the pandemic helped him make mccartney three a better album or even make an album um and then uh the aforementioned chaos even though it's not my favorite you know that producer uh kicked him in the ass which made him angry enough to make you know what others consider a better album <laughs> yeah so you know um it, it, it's kind of like are you a fan of vincent price never heard of him oh okay <laughs> uh Is that bad or it's well it can be uh <laughs> <laughs> somebody uh, i should be aware of well, he was he was a horror movie monster guy in, in a lot of films. Uh, he, his last film you might have seen or heard of, uh, Edward Scissorhands. Oh, oh, I like okay. that movie. You have seen that movie? Okay, yeah. so that was Vincent Price's last movie. So he's in it briefly. But he's also in Thriller. He does the narration on Thriller. You oh, know. that. Oh, yeah. that guy. That, yeah. that Vincent. That Vincent. <laughs> that Vincent Price. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, what was my point of bringing up Vincent Price? Oh, okay. So in the 60s, he made a lot of really trite uh, adaptations, adaptations in the loosest sense of Edgar Allan Poe stories into movies. I mean, they're cheesy and he hammed it up. He, he was chewing the scenery left and right. Um, so similar to McCartney, this is how I'm tying this in here. <laughs> in the late 60s, he got uh, saddled with a different director, which is similar to what McCartney did with Chaos. And uh, this guy got pissed off at uh, Vincent for being kind of very fey and just kind of chewing the scenery and doing just his typical Vincent Price stick. And so 
he got a better performance out of the movie is called uh the witch finder general so if you ever have a chance to see that it's actually a pretty good film if you like horror films if you don't well okay i'm not a horror <laughs> film person yeah. i'll but, admit yeah but you know if you are a fan of Vincent price and i'm telling this to other people you know it's like and you think he only just does his hammy type acting and uh stuff that he would do like on the batman tv show or cheesy comedies or cameos on hollywood squares or muppet show or whatever that you know he used to appear on every variety show just kind of being vincent price you know uh he actually shows that he has some acting chops still so that's kind of like what chaos is for me but you know even tug of war is kind of like that it, it kind of showed you know mccartney needs to prove himself every so often and this is an album that he did that with and it was very helpful that he did that, I think, you know, for me as a fan, because um, I'm not saying Back to the Egg was a bad album. It just didn't chart very well, that's all, yeah. in comparison, you know. Um, and I know the reasons on that one. I think it, it, he was trying for too many things all at once on that album, and which makes it an interesting, diverse album, but for the average listeners, like, well, he's going all over the map here. I mean, he has the broadcast over here and then the song called Reception over here. And then there's the Rockestra stuff over here. And, <laughs> and, you know, whereas this album, Tug of War, barring the Stevie Wonder track that we just talked about, pretty consistent. Like, I'm going to make a solid kind of rock and roll album with a couple ballads. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But now going back to Ballroom Dancing. Yes. This is the I best song on the album for me. I love that track, yeah. This version too, not the Broad Street one. Broad Street, <laughs> Broad Street one's like a bad cover of it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, I think William uh, Campbell, that's the one on Bar Broad Street. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, and- I have a theory now go into this i think um right after this album came out paul went into hiding for about eight years until 1989 and william campbell actually took his place and um (laughs) released all the awful albums (laughs) well i like chris and play and paul (laughs) and and paul guested it on um normal lonely nights and that was about it I have to say this about that. I remember when Broad Street came out is McCartney was talking about the song No Values and he he woke up with it in a vision kind of like yesterday, I guess. And uh, and like which is not even similar type song at all. But anyway, he says he he called up Mick Jagger. Is this a Rolling Stone song? It's like (laughs) Unless he vastly rewrote it, it sounds nothing like the Rolling Stones have ever done. It sounds like some sappy Paul McCartney rock. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, I just wanted yeah. to get that in because I can't wait till uh, 2024 to do the 50, 40th anniversary of Broad Street. I'd rather just talk about <laughs> Ed from Call Me Mr. Broad Street. I'm pawning that one off to you. <laughs> um what's the next song okay we're flipping the record over at this point right oh, yeah. um, we've been on the record for oh yeah ballroom dancing is the beginning of side two yeah that's right yeah. um the pound, is, pound sinking. is sinking this um, is a weird song yeah i was gonna say the exact same thing um the pound is sinking. I, I think i think what saves this album and pipes of peace for me not for you is george martin's production and he did this when he helped produce Live and Let Die, is that George Martin always knew, like, to take a song that's kind of, to, to well, we'll change the lyrics, take a bad song and make it better. Meaning the pound is sinking. It's not really that great of a song. But yeah. what makes it a good song is the production on it and the sounds of the coins tinkling down and and just different sound to it than just a standard guy with a guitar playing a song yeah and so that's what saves it (laughs) so that's where george martin excelled on these these couple of albums here when he was 
working with McCartney again. Yeah, so. totally agree. Um, now, I, I don't know. I like, I kind of like his weird vocal. It's a very underrated and creative song. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. <laughs> love it. You really love it. <laughs> <laughs> my microphone doesn't like me right now okay right. but you may not be able to see my head entirely but it wants okay. to sit still so okay right, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll not touch it here <laughs> i won't breathe on it <laughs> <Watch it. laughs> now i'm not with headphones because i'm in the living room and for some reason this my laptop i don't need headphones in the bedroom you, you've seen me before i need the the mic and the whole gear and all that stuff but you know not out here so yeah. anyway um shall we go to the next track or any more about pounds <laughs> um now going to track number eight which is the second best song on this album wanderlust paul <laughs> you did it right you did it right bud <laughs> I will have to say this. <laughs> I mean, it's about pop. It's obvious. Yeah. But it's perfect. I will have to say this. I didn't like it when it came out. I thought it slowed down the album. Shut up. This is when it came out. You got to remember, I, you know, I'm waiting two, three years for this album. And it's like, it, it's like, it, I thought it slowed the album down to a screeching halt. Now, again, when he redid it on uh, Broad Street, hey, the original one sounds pretty good. I like this one. <laughs> so, you know, there's something to be said about McCartney redoing his tunes. You know, it's like usually the remakes aren't very good. Um, do I like it now? Yes, I like it now. I think it's a really good song. I think it's one of his better type ballady type bombastic type songs, whatever you want to, you know. <laughs> however you want to label it it's not really a ballad per se but you know it's like he sings it with gusto and it's like and it's very passionate singing reading and <laughs> yeah so but when i was 15 i thought it was too lightweight sorry i, I like a little more heavier rocking sounds so. <laughs> time has is uh <laughs> revised time has made you softer Probably. Because <laughs> I thought this was one of the wimpier tracks at the time. And so I can tell you what I thought then and what how I think now. It's kind of weird I can still say that, you know, what I thought then, you know, but it's, it's yeah, I didn't think it was, I, uh, in fact, I, in the old, I still listen to CDs, but in the needle skipping days, you know, I just jump over it. Because the next song was one of my favorites on the album. It's kind of loosey goosey. I love Carl Perkins, always have. I'll let you praise this one. Yeah, I, I like it. And you know, it's it's a nice, like snappy upbeat song, you know, and the do 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 boom boom boom. See, I can sing the whole <laughs> I liked upbeat songs. What, I was what's not your next on... book. Mark Arnold sings the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> it's the audio, audio version. version it's the audio version of mark arnold picks on the beatles and i'll, I'll pick on by singing every song they did in their entire catalog um <sighs> so i take it you that don't like it. In... i take it you don't like get it no no <laughs> i'll oh, respect well. carl, carl perkins but like yeah you gotta get it mm -hmm. yeah no <laughs> <laughs> i don't get now i sound it. like him laughing at the end i think the laugh actually made the track for me that they left it in where he's laughing <laughs> so anyway i don't know i thought it was a good fun track and and i always like humor and you know in comparison to wonderless which i thought was a drag back then i thought this is more lightweight and this is more fun you know it's like um like you know I don't know, you know, it's like, I still think it's a fun track. Is it his best? No, but I mean, it's like, uh, it's better than the other song he did with Carl Perkins, which is on Go Cat Go, which I can't think of the title of it. Uh, uh, Blue Sweat Shoes. No, 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 it wasn't that. It was um, My Old Friend, you know, oh, right. which, 
which is kind of like mm, it's okay you know but had they put my old friend on here after wonderlust oh my god i probably would have thrown the record in the trash <laughs> yeah. Yeah. two sluggish songs in a row come on where's the rockers you know it's like you know <laughs> anyway. yeah um on to the next one yeah dress me up as a robber no 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 you gotta see the be what you see oh, be what yeah. you see link yeah this is useful useful or useless useless <laughs> okay <laughs> i thought you were being sarcastic which yeah i was like this that's what i thought when i was 15 when i saw this is useful <laughs> why, why did why did he put this on here you know it's like um this is kind of like the wild honey pie of the tug of war album it's like it's okay it doesn't really need to be there would it have been a better album without it probably um i don't know why he didn't expand on this one idea but you know probably george martin thought it was a great thing to put in there or something kind of mysterious and spooky but whatever i was never a fan of it so okay we'll go to dress dress me up as a robber okay go ahead you can uh play. not a fan okay <laughs> the second side of this album is weaker for me yeah yeah i'll agree um now since we talk about pipes of peace or at least i try to sandwich it into the conversation as much much as possible um dress me up as a robber or average person which one do you think is better average person okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> And now let let let's move on to Mark's favorite song on the album, <laughs> "Ebony and Ivory." Mm. Uh. Now I know I I know that you sing this one every time you uh, get excited. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> anyway, great message. Is yeah, it, it is a great message. You know, yes. it's like. But um, do I love it? Yes. Well, you know, I don't know. Here, here's my history with this song. Um, it was they had other songs before this, but maybe I didn't notice it. But I certainly noticed it afterwards. That after Ebony and Ivory, there was a lot of message songs that were supposed to make us feel good, like "We Are the World" and do they know it's christmas after all so after I, I i didn't mind ebony and ivory when it came out as much as how much i detested it later after all those other songs came out now um you 40 years later okay i do, i do like ebony and ivory i do like the message of it uh, okay fine um so you know the passage of time changes my opinions on some of these it sometimes makes me a big softy um sometimes it just makes me just appreciate uh the sentiment that was supposed to be drilled into my head at age 15 that i was rebelling against uh, you know um and like i said i thought it was too much of a kind of a, a rip on three dog nights black and white which i think was and is a better tune you know so anyway but hey it yeah. is what it is it now, you know i'd ra i'd rather have it released than in the can so i will say that <laughs> yeah now where would you rank this among mccartney's albums top um, 10 top 15 definitely top 15 probably top 10 i mean it used to be one of the top top ones because he didn't put out some of his later albums but um let's see for a while it was my favorite mccartney album uh even with my disparaging remarks about like half the tracks <laughs> but um over time it did drop over the years um i think it's dropped with everybody over the years yeah um and i think a lot of it has to do with just what was going on in our lives and mccartney's life at the time it was mainly a situation, and I already said it, you know, after Lennon's death, George and Ringo already made their statements. What is Paul, his former partner, going to say in response to this? And, you know, granted, it was a, a success. It went to number one. People liked it. Um, but it, it is kind of interesting 40 years on, other than here today, which is appropriate. He doesn't play anything from this album. 
he he no. doesn't really talk about this album it's almost like he's kind of embarrassed by this album so i don't know um not since 89 he did ebony and ivory and yeah. stevie came out on oh that's right and i saw that i was there i actually saw stevie do it with him you know and uh you know i didn't realize that was a one-off thing and it's like wow i saw something that i'll probably never happen again i mean he could come out on this tour but stevie i don't know does stevie still tour i know he doesn't put out new albums i, I don't guess think he, does. he does i think he's kind of in the dark kind of in the dark i'm great <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> wow uh no um I but yeah i know he has not I don't think he has any plans to do a new album anymore. Um, but I, he was touring a few years ago because a friend of mine did see him, but he just plays all the old hits. He's like Billy Joel, you know, he doesn't put out new albums either. So, um, you know, I think Billy Joel should put out a new album. He should, but you know, he doesn't feel like it. So, <laughs> he's gonna ride um, his motorcycle. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, the, um, the last time he toured with him. 2015 oh this is for stevie wonder yep oh, okay and i think that's when my friend saw him so um but yeah um i think he did the, well that was probably around that time too i think he did a performance for obama but i think that was around the same year too <laughs> so okay yeah that was probably the last time he toured okay yeah well i mean you know, I mean, Stevie Wonder's been around longer than McCartney has. I mean, he was, you know, his first record came out when he was 12 or something, you know, so um, that was... Which is you know. when the Beatles released Love Me Do, Stevie Wonder, 72 years old. Oh, okay, all right, so fingertips is the same as Love Me Do, all right, so... <laughs> um but you know it's like you know nobody's requiring anybody to tour i mean it's it, even mccartney and ringo took time off for a number of years before they toured again with good reason during the 80s but uh um yeah paul yeah. had to spend time making that out making bad <laughs> except for flowers in the dirt <laughs> and that's when he went to uh, went on tour again <laughs> yeah anyway, but, uh um I still like press to play. You you can like chaos. I'll like press to play. Sorry. <laughs> to each his own. Yeah. Another man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> but uh, let's see. Um, what else can I say about? What do you think, dog? I got my dog right here. <laughs> um. Uh. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So. Could it get revived? I don't know. It's like, you know, there's songs like, I don't know if you think this way, you know, uh, there's songs that McCartney has never played live. And I go, oh, I wish he'd play this. And, you know, but I don't know. There's nothing on this album, save for maybe, I think he's played Take It Away before. Maybe he hasn't. I think, he, I thought he did, but he should play that and Ballroom I mean, Dancing. I think if Carl, if Carl Perkins came back to life, I think he could pull off Get It. <laughs> you can do get it with Ringo. You know, Ringo can take the Carl Perkins part. But I don't I'm see him. Carl Perkins. Love, I'm going to get it. <laughs> Ooh. All right, all right, all right. Um, should I say any sort of final words? Um, I'm going to say my bit, and then I'll let you plug away. All right. All right. Now. It's probably at the 11 or 12 spot, kind of with off the ground, maybe. Um, I think it's better than off the ground, but yeah. <laughs> um, I would, yeah, I would say this is way better than off the ground, but around that kind of spot, yeah. I like it more as an album, more than the individual songs. Mm -hmm. I think side one's like a nine and a half, but side two definitely weighs it down. Oh, here's the dog. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> this is but, Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> i've gone on too long with this podcast <laughs> anyway continue <laughs> but um yeah now mark i will let your publicist there plug your uh podcast and your right, website well, lulu here loves it when i do <laughs> fun ideas podcast um i have good guests today i actually recorded one earlier today uh with uh sergio faria who wrote a book about 
Peter Torque of the Monkeys of all things. Wow. And he's he's based in Brazil. And yeah, it was a good interview. It, it'll be uploaded in a few weeks because I always upload these things. I'm like three weeks ahead. And uh what else? Well, I'm two um, months behind. So yeah. <laughs> And what else am I working on? I'm still working on my Mad Magazine book. I was actually doing some transcribing today. And uh, my next book coming out, which has just been approved by me for the publisher, uh, is a book on the history of Pac-Man, of all things. It was not my original choice to do, but uh, I got recruited to do. But it turned out to be a better book than I expected. <laughs> but I did it on my terms, that's why. Which is also celebrating its 40th anniversary. It came out in 1981. So, uh, you know, lots of 80s stuff going on around here. And still working on my Turtles book with Charles Rosenay. And... Uh, Someday my Disney book will come out. Someday my Warren Kramer book will come out. And I think I'm finally caught up. So okay, Ken I was, Womack. I was, I, what? I said, okay, Ken Womack. <laughs> well, I was like McCartney during the pan, the pandemic. I mean, I was writing, writing, writing. I, mean, I, was, I was at home all the time. I couldn't do anything. You yeah. know? And now it's harder to write because now I don't want to sit here all day. I want to go out and do things. So. And I'm assuming you work. What? And I'm assuming you have a day job. Oh, I do. You know, but when I'm done with the day job, the last thing I want to do is come home and work on a book. You know, but I do anyway, and I do these podcasts anyway. So I still somehow fit it all into my busy, busy, busy schedule. Yeah. And now that's where we're at. <laughs> now for me, you can go to www.solobeetlepodcast.com to find me. You can email me, HUD, <laughs> H-U-D at solobeetlespodcast.com. You can find us on all the socials. And if you are at the June 7th Fenway concert, please say hello, and you might get a little prize if you do. Ooh, what is that little prize? Your stickers. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> well, definitely do a podcast, even if you're doing it by yourself, right after the show, like maybe the next day or two. So you Parking can get... Lot. Parking lot if you can you know. oh my god it was the best show ever but you might you might be too tired i don't know to be you know <laughs> um oh my god i saw a beetle well that's essentially it i mean um, he didn't die on stage hopefully not <laughs> crossing fingers geez that would be newsworthy um now have you seen ringo before i forgot no oh, okay so this is the first beetle okay yeah, I saw Ringo. Ringo and I, I'll say this before we go, I guess. Uh, Ringo and Paul both went on tour again the same year, but Ringo got the head start. So I saw him first and uh, in 89 and then uh, flew down to L.A. to see McCartney because I didn't know if he was going to tour again uh, because he hadn't toured since 1976 in the United States. So that was 13 years. So I figured if I don't see him now, it might be another 13, 15 years, you know. Fortunately, he's been touring pretty consistently ever when since. When was the last time you saw him? Uh, for now, it's been 2005 because I think the prices are ridiculous. But as if I was you, which you're doing it, uh, I highly recommend seeing him. See, I've seen him five times. I would rather have somebody else see him that's never seen him. So that's why, you know, if you can afford it and you can do it, do it. It's highly recommended. Yeah. He does a great show uh the players that he's had for the last 20 years are all solid players you know it's like they can play and do anything and he and mccartney has a good sense of humor still he he uh has a lot of surprises they do a lot of uh visual things pyrotechnics uh i know on this tour if you haven't seen he sings a duet with john lennon uh but uh, back to life yeah <laughs> and you know uh, on screen so i mean it's like you know so there are cool things that he didn't do back then like he's willing to do now because he was still a little bit hesitant to do a lot of beatles numbers you know he, he's opened up in yeah. since you know we need more solo stuff come on Paul. yeah well i mean back then you know you know uh <laughs> he wasn't doing anything other than uh, this is I'm talking 89 tour not the later ones he, he did a lot from the current album he didn't even do a lot of solo stuff you know it's like it was like uh, you know but um 
he's kind of evened it out over the years the only my only complaint about mccartney live and this should not ruin your enjoyment it's just that there's certain songs he's never done in concert ever and it's just frustrating but like why uh, is it find my way being played (laughs) why is it get it not being played Be what you see. He could he could just slip it in there. Just <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, All right. <laughs> that was a wrap on Solo Beatles podcast.